Hey folks, Matt Eason here, Scholar Gladiatorial. So this is um, hopefully a relatively simple and straightforward topic, but it's essentially that a lot of people who watch, um, you know, fantasy series like The Witcher or even uh, historical inspired movies like Braveheart or whatever, I think uh, particularly kind of like the modern entertainment mindset, so Hollywood and, and TV, has given us the idea that big two-handed weapons are the way to go. They're often the weapons of heroes. Now, um, I'm not going to say that sometimes in history this wasn't the case. Of course it was. But the point I want to make um, is that these two-handed weapons that are used without a shield, and I'm going to talk about shields in a minute, um, you know, things like this Montante or this um, Danax often have a very specific tactical role. And generally speaking, for a normal soldier, for a normal person on the battlefield, not talking about one-on-one -on -one fights or um, street fights or this kind of thing, but on the battlefield, the kind of person that uses this kind of weapon is either dependent upon other types of soldiers to protect them, or they have a very specific purpose or they have to wear armour. And that's really what I want to talk about here. So I'm going to put down the two-handed weapon for a second. Even though they're lovely and they make uh, great choreography and they're very impressive on film and they, you know, they look big and impressive, they look like a hero's weapon. In reality, as we know, the majority of soldiers throughout history have used a shield with a spear um, and very often a sword as a sidearm. And when you think about it, throughout a lot of history, um, a lot of the soldiery, a lot of the, the soldiers fighting had minimal, or in many cases, no armour. So if we go back to the ancient period, yes, of course, the most well-equipped, the most elite soldiers, obviously Roman legionaries, um, if we look at, um, you know, Spartans or Greek hoplites or whatever, had some degree of armour. However, their armour isn't hugely protective. And if we boil this down to imagine uh, you kind of on a tribal society level, pretty much the simplest weapon that you're going to find around everywhere is a sharpened stick, okay? Or in this case, a light throwing spear. This is an African example. And pretty much anyone with access to wood can make spears, okay? Now, given that anybody can make one of these, anybody who ha doesn't have one of these in warfare becomes very, very vulnerable to really simple and cheap to make things like this. It doesn't even need to have a metal head. Obviously, this has a, a, an iron or steel head. Earlier on in the Bronze Age, they had bronze head, but even just a sharpened stick, most people within a very short period of time, probably a day, can be uh, taught to quite effectively up to at least kind of 10 meters <clears throat> and beyond that, in most cases, um, hurl a spear or a sharpened stick very, very effectively. Now, if you've got all of your um, your soldiers running around with weapons, as we would see in many, many uh, TV um, productions and movies, just running around with a weapon with minimal armour or no armour, usually as you know, because I rant about it often with no helmet, but often really with not very much apart from clothes on their body, or kind of leather armour, basically clothing, okay, heavy clothing, just running around with a weapon. All it takes to take that person out, that hero, is a person standing off to the side with a sharpened stick, okay? And they don't even have to get into hand-to-hand -hand combat with them. They can be 10 meters away and lob it at them. They can have several of these. They can chuck one after the other. And if you're in a, a skirmish or a melee situation where, um, where there might be multiple opponents and most of the things coming your direction, missile weapons, you don't see coming, you can't actively dodge a thing you don't see coming. And if you don't have armor on, then you might be the most awesome Axeman or Montante uh, Zweihander user in the world, uh, <laughs> the Witcher. Um, but someone standing off to the sidelines with a sharpened stick can just go thump and nail you <laughs> and you're done for. OK, um, so really, these kind of two handed weapons, certainly in medieval warfare, <clears throat> fulfill a very, very specific purpose. And generally speaking, if we look at uh, knights, for example, the so-called so knights, so men-at-arms in the Middle Ages, the typical weapon set was the lance, the couched lance, or, or used sometimes as a spear, very often, in fact, as a spear on foot, a shield, 
and the, the good old arming sword, okay? The two-handed uh, weapons like the poleaxe and, um, you know, various forms of gisam, uh, foshard, glaive, things like this, really start to come into their own in the 14th and 15th centuries when armor becomes heavier, more protective, more prevalent, more common even for common soldiers. In the earlier periods, if we look at the house cars, for example, they're a very, very specific example from the so-called Dark Ages or the early medieval period. Generally speaking, yet again, the typical weapon set, just like antiquity, is a spear and a shield, often with a sword as a backup for if the spear gets lost or broken or you're too close to use the spear. And um, the people using weapons like this obviously fulfilled a very specific tactical role and probably worked in close unison with people with uh, shields with large kite shields and to some degree were probably protected by them and probably came out from behind the shield wall or operated from behind the shield wall at specific moments for specific reasons which I won't go into now. Similarly the Montante or uh, Spadone, Zweihander, depending on what language you want to use, greatsword, often fulfilled a very specific purpose of um, bodyguards or protecting um, gateways or bridges or the fighting on the galley of a ship. So narrow spaces, um, but yes, they probably were very vulnerable to uh, missile fire. Um, and you know, someone with a sharpened stick lobbing it at them and nailing them. Um, so yet again, they have to be deployed in a very specific tactical way. So I guess the point I want to make is, um, Something that irks me slightly, but you know, something that irks me slightly, let's finish that point first, is that in Hollywood, should we call it, in movies and, and, um, and TV shows, often we see the heroes, be it, you know, Lord of the Rings or Game of Thrones or The Witcher or whatever else, using two-handed weapons and not really having enough armor on to protect them from someone lobbing a sharpened stick at them. Um, and really, what we should be seeing a hell of a lot more of are people using shields. Uh, because if you're not wearing really good armor, uh, then a shield is pretty much a necessity. And let's remember, in antiquity, the Romans, the Greeks, and other people who were wearing armor, they were wearing forms of, you know, the Romans obviously either lorica hamata or segmentata, so male or plate. Um, the Greeks wearing forms of, um, how do we call it armor? Uh, difficult to describe, but it's probably made of layers of linen, I think is the commonly held um, theory. But uh, sometimes with uh, bronze, you know, obviously bronze helmets, sometimes with um, bronze additions to the armor. Um, and they, even though they had armor, the shield was still incredibly important because the fact of the matter is that a thrown spear is not only incredibly easy to have and have a bunch of them, incredibly easy to use at reasonably, you know, short to medium range, uh, but is incredibly powerful. So anybody who's never thrown a spear or even just a sharpened stick at an object, when you do and if you do, you will be shocked at how powerful they are. Um, I've, I used to throw javelin actually from my school athletics team, so um, when I was younger I used to throw spears at things quite a lot. And I was always shocked throwing at pieces of plywood how far through the plywood, through a shield, and bear in mind that plywood is stronger than uh, a lot of historical shields would be made of, uh, how far it will go through um, the, um, the shield. And if you hit flesh, if you hit body, if you hit armour made of leather or even mail, it's going to stand a very, very good chance of going through and possibly going entirely through and out the back. Okay, so they're very powerful weapons and yet very easy to use and very numerous and very common. So, in a skirmish or battlefield environment where people might be throwing things, and it's not just spears, I've focused on those. Of course, there's arrows, there's slings, there's axes, even maces can be thrown, knives potentially. Any weapon that's thrown, but spears are probably the most common throughout history, javelins. Um, that's why shields are so important, okay? Because not only do they actively block things, but they passively block things as well, whether they're held in front of you or up to the side, wherever things are coming from, okay? You all know this. You all know that that's what shields are for. But really, shields are used remarkably little in the entertainment industry. Now, briefly, why is that? Well, quite simply, it's because it looks less fancy. It looks less um, fun to watch. So the choreography, once we start getting into, say, sword and shield stuff, or spear and shield even more so, 
is a little bit limited and is a little bit boring. And some people out there I know will study Spear and Shield or Sword and Shield and go, Matt, no, it's amazing. You can do this and that. And haven't you looked at Telhoffer's dueling shields? Haven't you looked at Palace Cal or, um, or I-33 Sword and Buckler? Well, yes, I have looked at all these things. But when you're doing movie choreography, um, we all, I think, probably know that it is easier to get actors to do something that looks like a fight-ish um, and look more impressive and be able to see more of it if they're using a single weapon. Um, it's easier to teach them as well. And also, shields have a horrible tendency, if you're, if you're a film director, of blocking uh, the sight, okay? They t tend to block people's line of sight and um, make it difficult to see what's going on. If we look at something like the 300, where they had to use shields, of course, or even um, Troy, uh, where they had to use shields because it's such an iconic part of the weapon set of that era, even though it's kind of fantasy version of it, but anyway. You'll notice that very, very often in the fights in the 300 or Troy or basically any class, even uh, Gladiator, any classical or ancient era um, uh, kind of um, setting, they often ditch the shields at some point and end up fighting with the swords alone, which I think historically would have been very, very rare for the reasons that I've stated. In one-on-one -on -one combat, you're at a big disadvantage now if you've only got your sword and you don't have a shield anymore. But more importantly than that, if people are shooting arrows and throwing spears and slinging stones all around you, then you're, you could just be hit by some random shot sailing across and clocking you in the, in the torso or in the face. Um, so shields insanely important and if you dropped your shield, if you, your shield broke, the strap broke on it or it split or something, I think one of your priorities as soon as possible would be to pick up a new shield because they're such a game changer. So to conclude, um, these heroic two-handed swords, and I would even apply this to long swords as well, are something that come about in very specific historical circumstances, either because they're being used for a very specific purpose where only a two-handed weapon can do that thing, or because they're being used with other troops who protect that soldier um, until they can deploy their weapon in that way, or perhaps for bodyguards, this kind of situation, um, or they're being used by people with armour. And certainly by, by the time we get to the 14th and 15th centuries, this is predominantly the case that the kind of people who are using um, you know, pole axes or two-handed swords or long swords even on the battlefield would be wearing very comprehensive and very protective armour. And that's why they don't need the shield anymore and they can ditch the shield and trust in their armour. If you're looking at heroes in movies and film, be critical of that in your mind and recognise that when they're fighting away in a melee and looking really awesome with their very powerful two-handed uh, axe or sword or whatever they're using, that they would be nailed and easy to take out by a person who's had half a day's training and can throw a sharpened stick from, um, from five or 10 meters away um, uh, if they're not wearing sufficient armor that would stop that. And honestly, even just a sharpened stick will go through a, a lot of clothing and straight through someone's body. Anyway, something to think about, <laughs> so as always, I'm always calling for more helmets and more shields in movies and TV series. I would like to see them, but I do understand why they're not there. Anyway, thanks for watching. See you soon. Give us a like and a subscribe if you haven't already. And see you soon for another video. Cheers, folks. Thanks for watching. We've got extra videos on Patreon. Please give our Facebook a like and subscribe if you haven't already. Cheers, folks.